Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to take your seats as we begin our second panel. Last November, the Richard Nixon Foundation launched the Grand Strategy Summit in Washington, D.C. Its purpose was, and is, as this is a national forum, to support a consistent approach to a national as opposed to a partisan foreign policy, a long-term direction for American statecraft, what President Nixon called the long view, linking American interests together like managing the relationship with China as a major power in the 21st century, weighing the impact of the war in Ukraine, how to best project Western influence in the Middle East, not just now, but in the future. At the summit in November, Dr. Henry Kissinger reviewed the grand strategy that President Nixon put into place, which was to essentially, as he said, combine power with purpose. Quote, at the end of his period in office, this is Dr. Kissinger speaking, President Nixon had given a new strategy and a new meaning and a new direction to American foreign policy that linked power to purpose and moved America to a position where at that point it was dominating the policy in the Middle East and achieved military superiority in the military field and was engaged in meaningful discussions with adversaries which had a rational mission of peace at the end of it. Of course, the breakup of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War changed the global balance of power. Today, any 21st century national security grand strategy must include American energy as a key component. So our second panel, Energy as Grand Strategy, uh, will now begin. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Luke Nichter, the James H. Cavanaugh Professor in Presidential Studies at Chapman University. Dr. Nichter is the author of nearly a dozen books, including his most recent, The Last Brahmin, on the life of Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge, and Dr. Nichter will introduce our panelists. Well, uh, thanks to the thanks, Jim, for the introduction, and um, uh, thank you so much to the uh, William E. Simon Foundation, the Nixon Foundation, the Nixon Library, and certainly those uh, assembled here with me today, uh, allowing us to have this important conversation about uh, energy as grand strategy, a Nixonian approach. So let's dive right in. We heard a little bit of history last night, and I think in our session today we, we, we will utilize that history to, to illuminate the present, but also to suggest where we might be going in the future. So each of you with me here has contributed to the subject of energy in uh, a variety of different ways. Uh, I, I, as a historian, uh, I, ha I have to get this question out there. Uh, be before I get into the specific questions that I have for each of you, I'd like to ask you to comment on two observations that I've made after coming through uh, the White House records since we're in the, the library building, especially tapes uh, regarding energy. So first, the, listening to the tapes on energy policy, which are still largely untranscribed, to even 50 years later, you can see Nick, uh, President Nixon in real time feeling his way into an unknown area. It's a domestic challenge, it's a foreign policy challenge with bilateral implications, it's a foreign policy challenge with multilateral implications, it's a trade, it, balance of payments challenge, and of course an environmental challenge. Fast forward to today, what's changed? How should Americans today see the challenge of energy? Well, thank you, Luke, and thank you to the Nixon Library. This is a wonderful event. I uh, really appreciate all the support that went, went into it. And reflecting on President Nixon and you know his approach to energy, it brought to mind my uh, exciting days on the Trump transition for the National Security Council staff when uh, KT McFarland asked me to go back and read the national security strategy that Secretary, not then Secretary, Dr. Kissinger had produced during the 1968 campaign and was then delivered to Congress in 1969. And what struck me about it was the two topics that were really all consuming to Kissinger being the Soviet Union and Vietnam 
or 50 years out, to a degree irrelevant. The Soviet Union, although Mr. Putin may have different views, uh, you know, no longer exists. And Vietnam, quite frankly, many Americans would struggle to find on a map. But for Kissinger in 68, 69, these were all consuming. And reading the strategy, what really came home to me, the critical lesson that Nixon and Kissinger were teaching us was to have a strategy and to think you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 years down the line. And in terms of energy strategy, then President Nixon very effectively did that 50 years ago. And I think, as we discussed in the previous panel, these can have very important lessons for us today. And so what I'd like to address as we go forward is what a national energy strategy for the United States looks like in 2023. Right now, our strategy is to get to net zero by 2050 by whatever means, and that, that is it. And I think if we go by our current circumstances, that will be a Pyrrhic victory. There are ways we can get to net zero. I don't know that 2050 is any better or worse than any other arbitrary date, but the process by which we get to net zero, I think, is, is critical and that we can think about that in a very Nixonian strategic way and the United States can, can lead the world in that process. So thank you. Please. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Luke. And I wanna really say uh, a big thank you to the Nixon Library and the Nixon Foundation. It's so great to be here in person. Um, just to step back uh, for a second, uh, for the audience and those watching online, what is grand strategy? Uh, Professor John Lewis Gaddis says that it is the application of means to large ends. So a grand approach to means, ways, and ends. And I think no one better in the world that got this was President Nixon. How many of you participate in something called the Nixon Seminar? Members of the Nixon Foundation can join us monthly online. And I really hope, if you're not a part of that, to talk about foreign policy issues you, you consider joining. We do that virtually every first Tuesday of the month. And I noted in uh, a prior uh, Nixon seminar um, a wonderful book by, I think, a great grand strategist, Winston Churchill. And it's a book called Painting as a Pastime. And I really suggest that you all look at this. Although he's talking about painting, he's really talking about grand strategy. Painting a picture must require an intellect of a grand scale. And so as we talk about energy today, uh, looking at uh, what uh, President Nixon did, and as Victoria noted in the, the security strategy, today I think it is an all of the above energy approach. I uh, have a very uh, uh, wonderful former staffer of mine at Exim who's now with an organization called Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions Forum, Chrissy Harbin. And, and later this week, some new polling data is going to come out. And I'm Republican. Um, and Republicans need to be talking about energy as a grand strategy. So Republican and independent national support, 83% of Republicans support an all of the above energy approach, which includes clean energy, nuclear, natural gas, as well as renewables, wind, solar, and hydropower. 80% favor speeding up government review of energy infrastructure project applications to build more in America faster. We heard about that on the last panel. It's a big problem and we need to speed this up. 77% want streamlined permitting and remove regulatory barriers to make it easier to extract and process the critical minerals in the United States. 87% support making it easier to develop the American minerals and resources necessary for clean energy production in the U.S. and our allies. 85% say developing American natural gas supplies is critical to our national security, and the planet is better off with more energy being produced in the U.S. because the life cycle emissions of American natural gas is 41% lower than of Russia. 
And finally, 79% support exporting more American-made natural gas to meet demand while reducing global emissions. So as we think about grand strategy from an energy perspective, taking President Nixon's actions uh, to today and going forward perhaps the next 50 years, I think that's some great um, insights. Thank you. And uh, William Martin, do you want to jump in? Thank you, Luke. It's a pleasure to be remote with you. And I have a four-year-old daughter, so that's why I'm here. And she's got a ballet recital. So nothing would, would come between me and the recital. But it's interesting. And in thinking about this conference, it is amazing to me how much Richard Nixon saw 50 years ago. We 50 years ago, um, I served in the Reagan administration, but I started my career at MIT Energy Lab because I was enthusiastic about energy and achieving energy independence, uh, which of course was eventually achieved by, and we got to thank them by the Trump administration and Dan Bruet and others. Um, the second thing he did, I think that was very important, was the environment. I mean, he created the EPA, not the EPA we see today. He he had a a, a more balanced. Uh, EPA, frankly speaking, and that's what we need to go back to. I remember President Trump saying, you know, I want clean air, clean water, clean energy. Of course, that's what we want to do. We want to reduce emissions, especially in the developing world, to, so we can reduce emissions globally of CO2, but let's just not go crazy on it. The third thing that he saw, and this I think is the most remarkable, is after the embargo, you'll recall that he created the International Energy Agency in Paris. That is exactly the forum we are using today in light of the Ukraine war to coordinate Western policies. He saw that by sharing oil against the potential of an embargo, we could avoid embargoes in the future. Now, that's a hell of a sense of deterrence. That's energy deterrence, frankly. And I had four years uh, in the uh, IEA to see it firsthand. By the way, the IEA has gone a little crazy on the climate side. But fortunately, they're back to energy security. In my eight years with Ronald Reagan as exec sec of NSC and also deputy secretary of energy, I saw us basically take all the Kissinger and, and I, let me say Nixon. I like Kissinger, but frankly speaking, it was Nixon that set these goals out. And we built upon them in the Reagan administration. First, in regard to the then concern about the Cold War, we urged our allies to diversify away from Soviet gas, and we succeeded, by the way, a lesson which Europe forgot all too quickly. Secondly, we, we promoted um, Western alternatives and diversification. If you think of Kissinger's concept of energy deterrence through the IEA, the key thing is energy diversity by source and by fuel. And this is where all of the above, and I couldn't agree more with that, is indeed uh, the important thing we need to think about. And all of these things fit together. The environment fits with national security, with energy security, uh, with economics and so forth, as we see a tailspin of the world economy because of higher prices. So all of these fit together. This man saw this 50 years ago. I, I must say, I find that remarkable. He'd already put together the pieces. Now, Middle East, during the Reagan-Bush era in the 80s, we pulled together an effort to end the Iran-Iraq war to begin with, and secondly, to build the defensive capability of Middle East countries so that that could be used uh, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Again, that was deterrence brought to us by Nixon. And frankly speaking, just to conclude, I don't think we give him enough credit. Until you basically put together this conference, this thought did not occur to me that how much we built upon in the Reagan years was based on Nixon and how much of the Trump years and Bush years were based on Reagan. So we really have to go back to the father of it all, Richard Nixon, and applaud his effort. It's so interesting. Uh, I think each of you said something I'd like to follow up on in kind of a round of questions kind of targeted each of you. Um, first, I think sticking with uh, William Martin, if I could follow up there, I think doing my best to paraphrase President Ronald Reagan of 1984, you know, despite the age and experience of those assembled on my panel, we were not in the Nixon White House. Um, and however, William Martin, in this case, was in the Reagan administration, as he said. And so I'd like to follow up with what you just said. Um, you touched on it, but if you can recall, how much 
do you think there was an awareness of what President Nixon contributed to in the energy field during that administration and during successor administrations? So I, I'd like to follow, that question's for you and I'd like to follow up because I think that fits with what you just uh, presented there. Absolutely, well like today we inherited a mess from Jimmy Carter. I mean, remember after the Arab embargo, we had Jimmy Carter and we went back to sweater, sweaters and all this kind of thing that we're talking about today. He, he controlled prices, he, he, he banned exports and so forth. So the first thing in the Reagan years, we had to go back to Nixon. We had to go back to free market principles of decontrolling oil, decontrolling gas allowing oil export, supporting nuclear power. And this was after Three Mile Island as well. It was not an easy job to be done. And importantly, supporting clean coal technology, exactly the, all of the above that we should be doing today. So that number one, energy, we continued energy independence, or at least striving for it. We didn't achieve it, but we put the signals in the right place. Secondly, going back to the environment, of course, we as Republicans care about the environment. Um, and, and indeed, we strengthened um, local concerns and, and, and regulations where they seemed sensible. But there was a cost benefit analysis in the Reagan years. We looked at what was the cost of this measure and what was the uh, benefit of it. And if there was more cost to benefit, we didn't do it because we were concerned about the federal deficit. Finally, I would suggest an excellent book by Peter Schweitzer, uh, which basically told the story of how the Reagan administration beat the Soviet Union because we used economic, and I'm going to use this word, warfare. I mean, we put a cyber bug in their gas management system. We blew up a couple of pipelines um, and we got the Saudis to increase production so that the world oil price would fall from $47 to 13 uh, and that put the Soviet Union out of business. Now, this is what we call grand strategy. Uh, we inherited oil prices at about $40. They ended at 17 because we freed up our energy sector. We got rid of windfall profits tax. That was my greatest achievement as deputy secretary. We built strength in the Middle East for energy deterrence, and we got the world economy back on track. All of that, all of that, initially was started by Richard Nixon, which we adopted. Now, uh, Kimberly Reed, you just completed your term as chairman of the Export-Import Bank uh, of the United States. Now, tell us a little bit about your experience, especially vis-a-vis -vis energy and how that fits into overall grand strategy. I was chairman of the Export-Import Bank uh, after the bank was closed for essentially four years because the Senate would not confirm uh, the nominees. So this institution was created back in the 1930s and its mission, I think, is the greatest mission you could ever have, supporting U.S. jobs by furthering American exports around the world. We want the world to buy American. We don't want the world to buy other countries' products because America makes the best in the world. And this includes uh, renewable energy and clean energy. One of my favorite things that I did was helping foreign countries understand the power of what we make here. One of my frustrations, however, was that we don't make enough when it comes to renewable energy. China makes the solar panels for the world. And we really need to be supporting U.S. businesses doing that more and more. And so that's part of, that was part of my mission. During my tenure, uh, we approved the largest deal Exum had ever done, a $4 billion deal. Exum had been closed. I got confirmed. And this entity reached out to say, let's reinvigorate this application we put in with you for buying $4 billion of made in America equipment on energy uh, to help the country of Mozambique do an LNG energy project offshore. Four billion dollars supporting hundreds of jobs across America. I also learned during this uh, application process that had XM not been reopened, which is part of grand strategy, the Export-Import Bank of the United States is one of the tools in the nation's trade toolbox. 
Before Exum had been reopened, this company was looking to buy these goods and services from Russia and China. And when we were reopened, they said, we want to buy from you. And so we provided that lending to make that happen, to allow them to buy that. Um, I want to step a, a, a back just a second, though, uh, because this professor here next to me, uh, can you see the pin I'm wearing on my lapel? Nixon Lodge from 1960. Nixon Lodge from 1960. I found this. This belonged to my grandparents. So obviously, you know who they supported back then. But as we talk about grand strategy, we don't even need to consider 1968 as the start of it. 1960, Nixon saw that America was energy independent. But after World War II, we started making a lot more money and people became much more prosperous. And so we started using more energy. Eisenhower uh, created the interstate system. So during this time frame, we built this great transportation uh, hub where we can travel anywhere. And that started using more energy. So with progress comes more energy use. So Nixon, 1960, we were energy independent. And then he witnessed what was happening during the 60s. And so that's why he came out with these landmark letters to the Congress to say, we need an energy plan. This is my plan. Please take action. But also I want to note, because you have done the definitive biography on Lodge. And so I'm sure you have more comments when it comes to grand strategy on that. You need to read that book. But um, I'm no longer at the Export-Import Bank of the United States, so I can't comment on what's happening there. But at the end of my tenure, late 2000, early 2001, I worked really hard to help countries like Poland and Romania know about the valuable nuclear equipment we make in the United States. And so I'm not going to comment on anything, but I met with government officials in both countries, have very detailed conversations, and I just saw in Reuters on April 17th, Polish small reactors project may get up to $4 billion in U.S. financing. And this article notes that $3 billion of it possibly will come from XM to support this shift to clean energy. This is a grand strategy. And, uh, and uh, I'm now on uh, a public company board of directors, a company called Hannon Armstrong Sustainable Infrastructure Capital. And I'm so pleased that not only is it the government's response, entities like XM, to help make clean energy, renewable energy projects possible, but it's also the role of the private sector as we talk about wind and solar, because everything we do in our country supports U.S workers and families and jobs, as well as our environment and our independence. Thank you. Well, we've covered a little bit of the past, uh, going back further in time than I anticipated to 1960, and we, uh, we brought it forward. But uh, over to Victoria Coates, let's uh, project out a little ways in the future. What might a strategic Nixonian approach to our Middle East energy relationships look like? Well, thank you, Luke. And I think, uh, you know, not to go too far back, but looking at the transition from President Nixon to President Carter, you went from a president with a very forward-looking vision to ensure the energy security of all Americans to a president who wanted to modify Americans' behavior to handle an energy crisis. And I think we've seen the same thing playing out today, where the uh, Biden administration's policy, as far as I can divine, is to change our behavior in order to get to their climate targets. And so I think as conservatives and uh, as a represent representative of the Heritage Foundation, which is also celebrating our 50th anniversary this week, so we're very excited about that, uh, that that we need to make very clear to the American people that it is just gross irresponsibility for any American to be energy insecure in 2023 and going forward. And the other thing, as Kim just alluded to, uh, President Nixon saw was a massive expansion in terms of energy needs. That is going to be dwarfed by what's going to happen in this country over the next decade, as everything from crypto to data centers that are going to fuel the uh, artificial intelligence revolution that we're all now terrified of are such massive power, uh, just <laughs> consumers, 
Uh, Elon Musk was talking last night about how if you want to shut down a dangerous AI thing, look at it from space because you'll see where all the heat is, where all the energy is being consumed and all the hamsters are running through the wheels of all those computers. Uh, that you, you know, you, this, this need for energy is going to be exponentially greater than even what we need today. So how do we satisfy that? This race to electrification, I call it a forced march, with no other considerations, is, is, is just a disastrous self-inflicted wound for the United States. We know China is dominating what it, we would consider to be the sort of currently climate-friendly technologies. We've talked about wind turbines, we've talked about solar panels, EV batteries. They are not doing this out of the goodness of their hearts. They're doing it because they fear the resources of the United States and energy. China is not only the world's largest polluter, it is also the world's largest energy importer. They can't fix that problem. So I think rather than abdicate this huge strategic advantage, we look forward in a Nixonian way. We figure out how we continue to use clean U.S. fuels to lower emissions. We look at low-hanging fruit, convert large-scale uh, uh, shipping vessels to natural gas. You don't have to build a new vessel, vessel. You can use the existing ones. Cuts emissions by 30%. Great. Let's do that. Let's figure out how we, we then also proceed with the technologies of the future. We have civil fission. We have civil nuclear. That is fantastic. But then we also have the incredible announcement out of Livermore National Lab uh, here in California in December about fusion becoming increasingly viable. Let's make that our moonshot. That's how you get to net zero. That's how you provide power to the developing world that will transform lives. And the partners that we would have in this, the other countries that are most forward leaning, are Great Britain, Israel, Japan. This is a wonderful group of countries with whom the United States can partner and lead the world on this technology. But Make no mistake about it, this would be no disinterested gift to the entire planet. I call this the Starfleet Academy trap. Uh, it, but rather, it would be very clear who's leading on this technology, who is offering this gift to the world, and who is protecting, like state secrets, this technology. So those are just some thoughts about how we might develop some, some strategic thinking. So in the next phase of our discussion, um, I'd like to kind of open up the discussion a little bit, and I have a few sort of general questions that uh, any of you might want to comment on in terms of what it means to take this Nixonian approach that we're all talking about going forward uh, in, into the future. First question, in which ways is energy policy also national security policy? That was a big thing that I focused on when I was at the Export-Import Bank of the United States. Uh, we were reauthorized in 2019 by Congress, and uh, it was the longest reauthorization in the history of the bank. And why was that, I think, in part? The legislation established a new program, and the program was called, and it still exists today, the Program on China and Transformational Exports. And Congress asked USXM, which could be lending at any time $135 billion, you need to neutralize China and advance America's comparative leadership in the world. And we're giving you the ability to match the rate, terms, and conditions that the Chinese Communist Party may be offering a foreign purchaser. So they pick American instead. And I'm sure you all know about the Belt and Road Initiative. This is a tool that helps get at that. Economic security is national security. We want the world buying our goods and services or our partner and ally countries' goods and services. And so when it comes to national security, I'm also pleased to see coming out of the G7, we just had a G7 uh, a, a meeting there in Japan, um, the US, Canada, Japan, France and UK formed a nuclear alliance. I think that's very important. Um, what I also think is interesting is what is China doing right now? And I know that we'll talk about that a little bit more, but um, China, that's my focus. Other comments? Well, I think actually, Luke, I'd go back to your last question, which I sort of dodged, uh, which was the Middle East issue. Uh, 
when I was working for Secretary Barrett in the last year of the Trump administration and doing a lot of, of regional travel for him, uh, even during COVID, which when your boss says to you in the fall of 2020, you're gonna go spend six weeks in Riyadh, you're like, oh, okay. Um, but he made it happen, so off I went. And one of his charges was, you know, we need to rethink these strategic relationships. And in terms, you know, in Nixonian terms, this is a massive opportunity. Because probably the smartest thing uh, President Carter did, and he got around to it in January of 1980, so he took his, his time, but was laying out a, a sort of Carter doctrine for the Gulf and providing some U.S. security guarantees to have the free flow of, of uh, energy through the Strait of Hormuz, on which the United States was then quite dependent. In the fall of 2020, that was no longer the case. And while I might not want the Strait of Hormuz to be closed for a variety of excellent reasons, it is no longer an existential threat to the United States' energy posture. So I was going to the Gulf, not as a supplicant asking for more production, but as a competitor. And my point to my Saudi counterparts was, you know, that this had been a total shift in posture and I could be a friendly competitor that I wanted to coordinate with them. But could we talk about next steps for what that coordination might look at, like when you're coordinating between a cartel and a free system? And the conversations were fascinating. They, both the Emirates and the Saudis were very open to these discussions. Huge opportunity for the United States so that I think you know, President Nixon would have seen and seized. Uh, certainly President Trump, Secretary Perry, and Secretary Boyette saw it. And I would hope any future administration would, would go back to those relationships and capitalize on the kind of good work that, that Kim did at XM in terms of promoting the United States abroad and, and offer ourselves as the partner of first choice. So I think, I think that is just it's something that, that we'll have to get after in the future. And William Martin, any thoughts? Well, I want to congratulate you for going to Riyadh for that long a time. And I want to thank you know, Secretary Bruet and also Mike Pompeo for the extraordinary job, the Kushner, that they did in Saudi Arabia. I mean, look at where the relationship is now. It's in shatters because our president said he didn't need fossil fuels. Well, let me tell you something. We need fossil fuels. We need a lot of fossil fuels, if not for us and for the developing countries. And we need clean coal and we need nuclear power. And I'm encouraged by these comments, you know, with XM. I'd like to see the World Bank and others step up multilaterally to support nuclear power, including the exciting area of small module reactors. You know, you know, what would Nixon be concerned about today? He'd be very concerned about the fact that Saudi Arabia has turned to China as a friend. And what you're seeing here is that Russia and China and Saudi Arabia all of a sudden working together. And even our friend, I think India is beginning to look around and say, gee, maybe I better join the other side. We are losing our alliances. The Trump administration, certainly Bush and, and, and Reagan, but I want to congratulate the Trump administration. You pulled together a lot of alliances here that were fabulous. And let's remember, we had no war. We had a good uh, economy and we didn't have COVID. So what's all this about, you know, the personality of the president? I like the president, by the way, <laughs> but uh, I'm an old, old guy, you know, but what can I say? I think he followed Reagan and of course Bush and and Nixon and let's face it Eisenhower if we take these great presidents and we say what were the best things that came out of them I think they were all very similar in a way and I think they all stood for the same thing and uh, as we look to the future but I can tell you there would be NSC meetings after NSC meetings now about what are we doing how can we separate out Russia and China when when I was with President Reagan, the first thing I did at NSC was to coordinate his international travel. We went to China. We tried to build on the, uh, the Nixon approach. And by the way, uh, Reagan liked China, but for some reason, they've kind of gone a different direction now. Uh, we worked with Russia. We ended the Cold War. And by the way, one of the things that we negotiated was the Eater Fusion Agreement that is now in Carterage, France, which will give us the greatest hope for fusion in the future, working with our allies, and it takes time and it takes effort, and it's no fun to go to talk to the Europeans. I mean, really, frankly, to try to convince them. 
But the best thing we can do basically is to return to this Republican presidents that really care about foreign policy. And again, I want to say thank you for going to Riyadh and Dan Bruet. He pushed LNG. The reason we're in good shape today is the Trump administration got us in a situation to export LNG to the ungrateful Europeans, by the way. Final point, developing countries. Um, I agree, we have huge energy needs here, but right now they are falling behind dramatically. And Russia and China will take advantage of that unless we step in through XM and other means. Uh, they'll provide nice energy, yeah, sure, uh, dirty coal to the developing countries. And the developing countries will appreciate it too because they need electricity for development. While our current administration says, ah, you got to go the green way. The green way is expensive. Maybe it's appropriate in our OECD countries, but not in developing countries. If we lose these developing countries, we lose the contest in the next 50 or 60 years. And the battleground is going to be energy and infrastructure. So let's dive a little bit further. It's come up a couple times, but let's dive a little further into the environment. Um, and the last panel, I, I had a, a bit of a chuckle during the description of upgrading our capacity and our, our power plants due to uh, wildlife and things. And um, being aware at Texas A&M for years of campus construction, I never learned Texas had so many birds <laughs> until we were trying to build anything. And I remember that it was the golden cheek warbler who caused us so many headaches uh, building anything on campus. But let's dive into the environment from that. Um, uh, let me ask the same question, but two different ways, and allow you each to comment. So how do we fulfill America's uh, growing energy needs without sacrificing the environment? Or how do we go green without sacrificing national security? Well, I, I would just say we have to start by not shackling any responsible uh, environmental policy to the People's Republic of China. Uh, the Government of current government of China has you know, continued to build you know endless series of coal plants even while they're protesting that they're interested in getting to net zero by 2050. Uh, you know this we we simply cannot abide by the fantasy that Beijing is suddenly going to become a responsible partner on climate. Under current management, they will not. They are trying to exploit it. And so I think unshackling a responsible climate policy from that fantasy has to be step one. And once you do that, you can look at how the United States has very effectively lowered emissions through the transition to natural gas and how we can continue that good work, as I mentioned, uh, through shipping the great announcement yesterday out of Exxon and, and Chevron that they're partnering with Toyota to potentially come up with a, a greater degree of renewable biomass in the fuels that can power the cars we already have. Uh, you know, we don't all have to race to an, an, an electric vehicle with a very dirty Chinese produced battery in order to have these emissions uh, lowered. We can do it through other means. Now, of course, we would need some of the same incentives that we've seen for the, the forced march toward electrification, but how much better would it be to have that be toward a non-disruptive technology that would allow the vast majority of Americans to use the vehicles they already have, the fueling stations that we already have, the kind of time frame for fueling that we're accustomed to, than to create this you know, whole-scale whole transformation of, of society, which most Americans do not want, and we don't have to force upon them. So I think that's where I would start. As I noted at the beginning, um, it's all of the above. We've got to do all of the above. Uh, and clean energy, I think, is a red, white, and blue issue. Um, and the future's bright. And I really want to encourage everyone to think about focusing on companies that can do this for our country. Um, we need to deal with the regulatory red tape that we heard about last night and earlier today. It's a huge impediment, so we need to get our arms around that. And uh, 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 I don't know if you saw in the news, but Germany just ended nuclear power. They're taking down their reactors. And I just want to give you uh, an idea of what they're faced with as we think about all of the above solutions for our country. Uh, German Chancellor 
Olaf Scholz speaking at the world's leading trade show for industrial technology, the Hanover Fair, he just stated that Germany has to build, and this is Germany, think about how much larger the United States is. Germany has to build four to five wind turbines every day, more than 40 soccer fields of photovoltaic systems, 1,600 heat pumps, and four kilometers of transmission network to become climate neutral by 2045. And he said, it's going to be a tour de force. So America needs to get it going with manufacturing and investments in becoming independent through all of the above solutions. I also want to see us expand from green, the topic of green energy, um, to clean energy, because absolutely, as uh, Mr. Martin said, it is um, uh, key to, to, to independence and uh, in our future. And William Martin, we give you the last word on this one once again. Well, I was honored to serve with uh, Ruckel's House as the vice chair of the World Resources Institute. So I'm a Republican that cares about the environment. Also a Republican that cares about the cost, because I think if you look at the German example, and that's wonderful, their electricity prices have tripled. And uh, one of the concerns I have is how many customers in America, if you gave them the option, you want clean energy or at three times their electric bill, they're going to say no. They're going to say, you know, I want some clean energy, but I cannot afford three times the price for my electricity. Um, that's why I say we need, the Democrats always talk about what we need to do here, or the, even the G7, decarbonization, let's say. But the reality is the emissions are going up, as the panelists have said in China and elsewhere, we need to reduce global emissions, and we're going to reduce global emissions by transporting more natural gas and replacing the coal plants. And this is where the, this is very key because if I had an opportunity to debate somebody or you know in the uh, in this administration, I could show them how Republicans are actually going to do better on the climate issue because we care about natural gas, we care about nuclear energy, we care about clean coal. You know, the G7 just came out and said, oh, "Okay, it's okay to export some gas to the developing countries." But, you know, if we look at the development needs and we look at the environmental needs and we look at the energy security needs and we look at the geopolitical situation of China and Russia competing for these same markets, then we can come up, I think, with a grand strategy at least cost and most effective. So I think this behooves the next Republican administration when we take over in 2024, by the way, uh, like you did with 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 the famous Kissinger NS NSDD one. I remember talking about that with Keith Kellogg, you know, and Michael Flynn and KT. I mean, the point is we've got it right in the Republican policy. It's interesting. It's all based on Nixon, but he gets no credit. But that's okay. I don't think he cares about getting credit. But this is why this is such a useful conference, bringing back with grand strategy and put all of these pieces together. And I think my panelists have put together more pieces than I have, but I, I think this is the task of the next Republican administration and the energy uh, Congress. Let me say one bit of information I found out. There was a debate in the Congress among the Republicans in the House for, um, for HR1, which by the way is quite a comprehensive package. HR1, that shows where they're putting energy, energy security. And there was a debate, is, should it be energy dominance or should it be energy independence? And those wiser than me chose the word independence. So again, going back to Nixon, with all due respect to President Trump for achieving energy dominance, uh, we're the party that can bring it to the table. So moving to our final question and our remaining minutes here of our discussion, um, I'm going to use you all as guinea pigs for something that I enjoy doing in the classroom for my students at, at nearby at Chapman University. So we approach another presidential election in 2024. Uh, perhaps once again, it would be called the most divisive election in American history. Uh, we will see how the media labels it. But each of you have a, something important to say about the policies that are shaped by the candidates, uh, especially as it pertains to energy. So an, a final round robin approach here, how would each of you brief a presidential candidate on the subject of energy? 
I would come at it from an economic perspective. So support a whole of government approach. Uh, when Victoria and I served in the Trump administration, we had something called the deal team. Uh, I've heard from everyone around the world, America is hard to do business with because all of your agencies are stovepipe. You deal with this agency to get one program, another agency to do another. And so we really got at that by creating something called a deal team so that it's one-stop shopping approach. And so I would encourage um, future president, whether Republican or Democrat, make sure that we are seeing the needs of our customers around the world. Look at what our competitors are offering our uh, customers around the world, potential customers around the world. And deal with it from a regulatory perspective, an administrative state perspective, so that we get rid of this red tape and complication, uh, so that they wanna come back to us. Um, I also uh, want to be sure um, that our next president is focused on rare earths and uh, lithium and these critical minerals. Um, and I want to say, just being very respectful, that rather playing to the strength of U.S. energy and abundance, the current administration is stumbling into another OPEC. And this time, it's for lithium and rare earth. So we do not want China to create an OPEC for lithium. And so I would encourage our next president, and our current one, not to let that happen. Well, I you know, work for a 501c3, so of course I would offer this to any candidate of any party, uh, but given my background in political hackery, I think it's unlikely the other side would take me up on it. Um, I think the key thing for anyone going into 24 would be, you know, take this bigger, make energy a metaphor for the role of the United States in the world and that the United States should fuel the future. We are the hub of innovation. We are a hub of energy, literally, to fuel that innovation and carry on into the next American century. And that the vast majority of Americans, there are, is a small minority that want to take us for the first time in human history to a less dense, less productive energy source no, we don't have to do that. Make this about the reverse of that, of taking us to greater energy, greater security, greater power, literally. And so figuring out who, how, as Kim was saying, we do that in terms of the regulatory environment. And I would also encourage them to, as the you know, national security strategy, the national defense strategy are mandated by uh, Goldwater Nichols to be delivered to Congress, voluntarily deliver a national energy strategy, security strategy to Congress in your first year that will be a roadmap for where you're going in your, in your term. And that can give clarity to the Congress on where the Congress should go. It can very importantly give clarity to private industry on the kinds of policies you're going to undertake so they can think about their long-term investments. And it'll give clarity to our partners and our enemies abroad about the United States' intentions in the energy field. So I think this is a huge winner for conservatives, uh, and I very much hope any and all of our candidates embrace it. When William Martin? Well, uh, one thing, my colleagues have touched on everything, so I, I'm left with one thing, and I agree with them, by the way, 100%. One thing we haven't talked about, and I think it was a concern of Nixon's, it's kind of regulation and strangulation. I, I heard uh, that from some in Congress on the Republican side, that if you look at this uh, IRA, this uh, Reduction Act, probably only at most 20% can be implemented and probably closer to 5% because of the problems of regulation. So if you think of the challenges of moving a pipeline through five states and then getting an export permit to do LNG, that's a concern of the Republicans. Or if you're a Democrat, how you actually get wind and solar on the transmission line, you, you see? Now, that to me was a wake-up call that we mustn't forget the fundamental reason that we're Republicans is to get is to get, get business back to work and reduce government regulation. And again, I think that's something Nixon would do. So I would set up a um, kind of a, an interagency group that just looked at this issue. So this is what our priority is in energy. And then what do we need to do to actually make it reality? And that goes from Wall Street right down into the infrastructure, 
because we're going to go nowhere if we if we if we can't get rid of some of these needless regulations. And I think we have time for one more quick question. As a baseball fan, I can't help um, but use a baseball analogy. Um, so if Yankee Stadium was the house that Babe Ruth built, we're sitting here in the house that Richard Nixon built, or at least adjacent to the house that his father built <laughs> outside, uh, famously. So for young people, and I spend most of my time with 18 to 20 year olds, and it's surprising sometimes what they know and also what they don't know about a lot of things. Uh, for, for many young people, Richard Nixon is this far distant figure uh, who can't possibly have any relevance to their lives any more than maybe Abraham Lincoln or something or the American Civil War. So I asked each of the panelists, in terms of closing remarks, 50 years after a very consequential presidency, why does Richard Nixon still matter? As we've discussed and as we celebrate the theme of this conference, the 50th anniversary of our energy policy for our country. That is so huge. He needs to get credit and I'm so grateful that the library and foundation are putting this on so that we know this going forward. I would encourage young people um, also to learn about national archives at presidential libraries. And I would encourage academicians like yourself to do what we do um, as I prepare every month for the Nixon seminar. The archives here sends us Nixon's documents with his handwritten notes. I have, and you can get and look at his energy speech. What did he edit and where was he on all of this? It helps you become more passionate about the decision-making process um, in our leaders. So um, I think not only energy, but we're gonna hear about a lot of big greats this year that Nixon made possible, including bringing home our POWs, which we'll be also celebrating the 50th anniversary of this year. So um, I would say this, organization furthers his grand strategy, don't you? Because it's helping us take it forward. Well, I strongly in, uh, endorse all of those comments as a, as a former archivist myself, which is how Luke and I first got to know each other. I, I think that these institutions are extraordinarily uh, important for learning about history. But then I think Nixon in particular, for young people today is such an amazing American story. Uh, across the trajectory of his career, including Watergate. I mean, that obviously was a, was a, horrible, uh, a horrible period in his life, but what has always been remarkable to me was his resilience, his ability to come back, to build this institution, uh, to continue to serve the nation in many ways as a thought leader, as an author, uh, and is indeed a grand strategist who continued to hammer away at the importance of having this forward-leaning vision. So I think if you are asking young people to figure out you know, what their trajectory might be, that their circumstances might look dire at any given moment, but that's the great promise of America. You can always come back, you can always contribute. Uh, and I think Nixon is literally the poster child for that and so is a very powerful voice for our young people today. And William Martin? Well, when I was 12, I went out to the airport in Tulsa um, my father took me uh, to, sh to, to shake the hand of Nixon. I, I, I've never washed it since. It's, it's incredible. <laughs> you know, um, I have to say, my father also said, if Kennedy wins, we're leaving the country. Well, we didn't leave the country. We stayed in Oklahoma. And uh, uh, we, we went through, you know, the Kennedy years and so forth. Now the other side has a chance. I mean, these Biden people, they're, they're in there now. Give them the four years. They're making a mess of it. They're making an absolute mess of our country and the world, um, frankly. So I think this conference is is what I would urge young people to look at, the archives. The, but you have to shorten it, Luke, I think, to like two minutes. This is Richard Nixon in two minutes. <laughs> and uh, it's got to be more than Watergate. Look, I was involved with Iran-Contra, okay? Scandals happen. I mean, uh, uh, they are unavoidable now whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, they're gonna happen. If you really look back in history, that was really not a very big scandal. It was at the time, because it was kind of the first, but frankly speaking, uh, you know, it was kind of modest compared to the other uh, scandals that we're seeing now, especially with the current administration. So I thank very much the center. I'm sorry I can't be there, 
I would love to be there, but my panelists seem to have done a great job and I, I adore their comments and thank you, Luke. Luke, by the way, you wrote a book about Henry Cabot Lodge. Uh, I wrote a Harvard Business Review article with George Cabot Lodge, who was his son. It was 1974 and I looked at American ideology because George was very interested in that and had a famous daddy. And also he had just run against Ted Kennedy and lost. You know, I mean, this was uh, going back to Massachusetts politics and so forth. But I'm still in touch with George today, or at least I was five months ago. He's about 93. But what a great family that was. And I'm going to buy your book. Well, I can think of no better way to close our discussion than leave it right there. So uh, please uh, join me in thanking our panelists. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our second panel. We will take a 15-minute break and be right back with panel three.